Optometry is not unlike other medical professions. People can have a real cookie cutter approach to the way that they see patients. And that doesn't allow your you to see your patient as a full human being, right? You may only see them as a set of eyes or that glaucoma patient or patient that's not compliant, right, right. in some way. But when you take the time to really get to know your patients and understand what may be some of those barriers that may be keeping that patient from actually being compliant with that treatment plan that you have have set forth for them it gives you a different perspective and it brings I think some humanness to you as a doctor it's part of what DEI is right giving every patient the opportunity to be heard to feel like an individual um, and to be treated with um, a very personal approach hey eyes and shine there my friends and welcome to the I give a damn podcast the show where we explore the fascinating world of optometry and dive deep into the stories and experiences of those shaping the field this podcast is brought to you by Fluorescein Media, the same company behind ODs on Facebook. Today, our special guest is Dr. Paris Wright, ODFAAO, an expert in the field of retina and low vision whose journey is as inspiring as it is educational. Dr. Wright has not only found her passion in low vision, but has also dedicated her career to teaching both aspiring optometry students as well as seasoned doctors. In our conversation today, we'll explore Dr. Wright's personal journey, how she discovered her calling in not only optometry, but low vision specifically, and as an educator, as she not only educates students in the classroom every week, but also enjoys presenting CE lectures at the many conferences throughout the year. But that's not all. Dr. Wright today brings us a unique perspective to the table as we discuss the impact of diversity on both the practice of optometry as well as the profession as a whole. So. Whether you're a seasoned optometrist, a student eager to learn, or simply have a burning passion for what you do, this episode is for you. But before we jump into the conversation, I want to remind our listeners to please subscribe to our YouTube channel and or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. This really does help us out and grow and scale the show. So in return, I promise to bring you more incredible guests and insightful content. But without further ado, please, let's welcome Dr. Paris Wright. Paris, thank you for being on the podcast, thank coming you. in and speaking with us. Uh, for all of our viewers, listeners uh, who, who are joining us in and haven't had the pleasure of meeting you before, uh, before, can you give us some insight, just your backstory of how you found optometry and your passions within the industry? Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, for me, I don't know that my story is unique, but I think it's kind of interesting and funny. Mm -hmm. So I was a sophomore in high school and I just was having a lot of issues seeing the board at school. Mm -hmm. And so I went home and I was telling my mom, like, I can't see the board at school. And I had never had an eye exam. Like now that I think back, I don't think I'd ever had an eye exam before that. And, um, and I said, I can't see the board at school. And my mom said, are you trying hard? And I was thinking, how hard am I supposed to try to see? I opened my <laughs> eyes. I don't see right. the board. Somehow, yeah. Yeah. somehow using your eyes yeah. more. And so, um, and so she said, and she really thought that I only wanted glasses because my friend had recently gotten some glasses. And so she was like, you better really need, like, you better need some glasses. I'm going to take you, I'm going to take this day off from work. We're going to go and you better need some glasses. So she took me to um, a, uh, like, commercial practice like in a mall location and I got my eye exam and the optometrist was like yeah like she really needs glasses mm -hmm. and then my mom felt really bad because she was like I had you struggling and you couldn't see and I told you you know I was really upset you know and and so when I got my glasses and I went and I was talking to the optometrist and I said what do you call what you do because I would do that for people every single day if I could like how do you do that and he said I'm an optometrist and I don't think I'd ever heard the word optometrist and so I said oh can you write it down on a piece of paper for me and he wrote it on like a little sticky piece of paper and I kept that paper for years I think until I went to optometry school because I was just so impressed and he just was doing his job and so it really had a major effect on me because before mm -hmm. that I mean i 
knew that I would be some kind of doctor because I felt like that's what I wanted to do, help people, that kind of thing. But I was so um, just moved by him making my vision clearer um, and being so surprised about how blurry I really was. I think when I got my glasses, I was like a minus two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's significant so, enough, right? Especially yeah. for like a student. Yeah. So, um, and so I remember walking out with my glasses on because um, they made them on site and I went back and I picked them up oh, and I wow. put them on and I was looking around the mall and I was looking like and I, I was like wait people see like this like it was like everything was in HD you know right. um, <laughs> and I remember walking out and my mom was waiting for me in the car and I walked out and I remember looking up into the sky like looking at the trees and there was like leaves on mm -hmm. trees and I was like people see leaves on trees like I was like just blown away because I don't think I fully realized like how blurry you know my mm -hmm. vision was but I was so enthralled that I w literally walked out into the park and I wasn't even and I almost got hit by a car <laughs> oh, <laughs> because wow. I was so like just moved by like that people could see like leaves on trees yeah so that that's a I love hearing those types of stories because yeah. everybody I think most people in optometry I think have some experience like that and almost I think any doctor in any healthcare field has some moving moment yeah have you ever uh did you know if that doctor that you saw at that time do they still practice have you ever I seen don't even since? know because he didn't even write his name down oh. you know and that particular uh, commercial like corporate it doesn't exist anymore okay. I just have no idea who he was but he changed my life well maybe you know? maybe they'll listen to this and they'll hear this story <laughs> and they'll be like I know that yeah, I remember yeah. that <laughs> that'd be really charming because I I had a similar experience with with contacts I mean I had glasses since I was eight years old but for me it was uh, I was 13 got contact lenses and it just it changed so much of my life yeah. in terms of being able to play sports because I could play sports I could make friends mm -hmm. making friends I had self confidence suddenly girls started paying attention to me and at that time of your life it's so important absolutely uh, that's like the biggest deal you know at that age so um, well thank you for sharing that with with optometry school where did you end up attending I went to Nova Southeastern to Nova in Fort Lauderdale yes and, which I loved and you, yeah you you went there and and now now you teach right yes yes i teach at midwestern university chicago college of optometry so it's located in downers grove illinois mm -hmm. um and it's one of the newer schools i would say i mean we've just in may graduated our third class amazing so we're super excited you know um and thriving uh, it's a really beautiful campus really beautiful um university the college of optometry specifically um is really lovely mm -hmm. the clinic is beautiful we have a really big uh like six floor multi-disciplinary clinic um and so it, yeah it's a lovely place to work well i'm glad that you guys are you're enjoying it you're finding success with all of that i i haven't yet to get to that academic institution but hopefully someday i'll, I'll be able to go there and maybe guest lecture or something yeah, yeah. I don't know. welcome anytime <laughs> so um with that what what is it you that you teach what are your passions with uh, optometry at the school so I teach two courses I teach uh, low vision rehabilitation mm -hmm. um, and then I also teach clinical medicine procedures okay. so um, I think low vision is fairly self-explanatory but uh, clinical medicine procedures is a course where I teach injections I teach physical diagnosis so head and neck exam mm -hmm. um, um, what else uh, different sorts of like uh, orbital um, uh, auscultation, um, suturing, uh, different types of suturing, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Which a lot of those techniques are things that I think a lot of, especially older docs who've maybe graduated 10 plus years ago, maybe never, never got that yeah. hands-on training. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I, I mean, I graduated, well, I don't know, 2007. So that's a good while ago um and we didn't get suturing uh, you mm -hmm. know when i was in school um that stuff that i had to learn you know later and we I, we touched on it we did have injections you know we did learn injections um but definitely not to the depth or level that i think that you know we teach it like in my course currently mm -hmm. um and then obviously with all the injections and all the new stuff that's out um i don't teach the um like uh uh, radio frequency cert that's in a different like a surgical okay. course or whatever but they get a lot of the it, there's a lot of overlap sure um like in wound management and stuff like that and i think that's those are important to have that overlap yeah because uh, ultimately that's you're going to see all of those things with absolutely practice. absolutely with um certainly you do a, not just teaching in the school you do a lot of ce lectures as well how how did you find that first teaching and and i think overall how did you even find that that was your your calling your passion 
Um, I came to teaching, I think, in a bit of a circuitous route. Um, so when I was in optometry school, teaching wasn't on my radar. It wasn't like something I was like, oh, yes, when I co- I'm going to be a, like that was not on my list of mm-hmm. things to do. I really planned on spending my career working for the VA. Um, and so when I came out of school, I, I did work for the VA. I did my residency at a VA hospital and then I proceeded to like run a low vision clinic at mm-hmm. a VA hospital for years. Um, but when I was a resident, I got the chance to supervise fourth year students and I was like wow this is I kind of like this you know this is really nice um and so that's what kind of piqued my interest in teaching a little bit Mm -hmm. um and so I flirted with the idea of coming out of residency and going directly into teaching and I did get some offers to come teach at a few institutions when I finished my residency but I still had the passion for working for the VA um and really wanted to pursue that and so I ended up going to work for the VA um but never lost that just want to teach and and want to interact with you know generations coming behind me right in optometry and so um, many years later I came into teaching um, and uh, after you know working in the VA for many years I worked in private practice for a short period of time um, and then came into teaching Um, and it was just it felt like a calling it was like an unfulfilled like want passion you know that I, I really was interested in pursuing and so I got the opportunity to do that so I'm happy that I have chosen that path right at this time in my career and then with regard to like CE um you know we have to do a a lot of lecturing at school like we are you know when you have a course to teach I mean you're teaching you're writing a lot of lectures lectures, right (laughs) um and so um one of our responsibilities is, you know, scholarly activity, and you can do that a multitude of ways. So it could be research, it could be lecture, you know, just a bunch of different things. Um, and I got the chance to, you know, be asked to, you know, do some local things, and I really liked that. And I was like, oh, maybe I can do this on a, mm-hmm. you know, more national level. Um, and um, and I was rejected, you know, a bit, you know, when I first started submitting lectures. Mm-hmm. Um, but then. You know, I I guess I got better at writing my proposals for my lectures because then they started to get picked up at different places. And so now I've been able to do, you know, quite a few. Good. And I really do enjoy that. And I, I lecture on a multitude of topics, um, typically low vision, um, a lot on low vision, and yeah. then uh, some on, like, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, I like inter sectionality between like ocular disease and low vision so i do do some lecturing on uh like diabetes and low vision that kind of thing and i think those are all amazing topics and i want to i want to touch on those in just a second but the one question that came to me is because you have experience teaching both students in the school Mm -hmm. and then going and standing up on a podium and giving presentations to practicing doctors your colleagues Mm -hmm. What has been your experience like? Do you have different feelings? Uh, do they present different challenges to you? Do you get more anxious or anxiety or excitement? <laughs> do you prefer teaching to one or the other? I'm just I'm just curious from your perspective. No, they're definitely different. I think um, when you teach students, um, and I have either the I'm fortunate or unfortunate, I don't know, but all the lectures that I teach at the university are all 8 a.m. classes. <laughs> and so either the students are excited, right, and they get up early and they're, re- you know, they're ready to learn. But sometimes you just get sleepy students, like they drag themselves in, they're tired, right? And nobody really wants to come to like an 8 a.m. lecture mm-hmm. um, and sit there for, you know, two hours or whatever. But um, so they present different challenges, I think, because um, students sometimes don't want to feel like they don't know something so sometimes they won't ask questions Mm. you know and so you have to anticipate the things that they may not understand ahead of giving the lecture so that you go into depth with explaining things and you make sure that you're teaching to all the different modes of learning right Mm. um when you are standing in front of your colleagues and you are giving a lecture they know as much as you oftentimes about a topic right and so either they're going to be really really engaged um and uh or they're going to be bored um or you get people in the audience sometimes that really want to challenge what you know and so sometimes it's um 
can be a little nerve wracking, I think, you know, to, sure. to stand in front of your colleagues um, and put yourself out there and, you know, teach a course. But I think most people come genuinely enthusiastic about, you know, the course. And some people, they're just like, I need CE, so I'm going to sit here, right, <laughs> for this hour. And, you know, and sometimes they're not listening to you, um, but but oftentimes they are. So I, I imagine this some, some of the students, because I remember being a student and having that, like, I... I don't want to look stupid mm -hmm. you know i imagine even that is that carries forward into some of our, our colleagues too. i'm sure i'm sure and there's times it's like i do want to ask a question but i don't want to do it publicly i want to like pull off to the side right. and ask the question yeah uh, but thank you for sharing that that's yeah. it's just good to get kind of your your feelings and insight on that yeah i think they don't realize i'll say this uh i think what people don't realize is when you stand in front of people and you give a ce lecture mm -hmm. you're nervous too kind of you know sometimes like you, it's 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 nerve-wracking a little bit just to stand in just public have... public speaking absolutely is, is, is a bit nerve-wracking yes. exciting yes the uh, i think certainly with all of your lectures i think low vision is is fascinating i did some low vision when i did my residency at the va uh, what what kind of what brought you to low vision like what was your what was your passion like so how did you find that I think I'm unique in the fact that I came to optometry school already knowing that I wanted to do a residency in low vision, like before I ever started optometry school. Um, and I knew that because I had had the fortunate experience of being exposed to low vision prior to optometry school. I worked as a technician for uh, four years in ophthalmology practices. Um, and I worked for a retina specialist specifically who um, did have a low vision person come in like once a week and work with some of the uh, AMD patients and stuff like that. And so I got to see that in action and optometrists doing that and, and be exposed to that and ask a lot of questions about, oh, like, how does that work? and oh you're enhancing people's quality of life and people would realize oh I can actually still read I can actually still enjoy you know things that I enjoyed before my vision loss and I was inspired by that because I it was like the same feeling that I had when I got my glasses I thought wow if I could do that for people I would do that every day you know <laughs> um and and so I went to optometry school already with the idea that okay I'm gonna finish optometry school I'm gonna do a residency in low vision and I'm gonna help people in this way that's beautiful, and uh, I'm I'm impressed that you knew you had. That, I'm glad that you had that experience and that exposure because when I got to optometry school, I didn't even know residency was a thing. Uh, I'm just like, wait, what? Uh, this extra year, or yeah. you know, so that that's that's just great that you had that mindset. Uh, with um, now, you mentioned that one of your other lectures is about diversity mm -hmm. and touching on that, and I think that's a topic that just isn't given enough light. Uh, can you tell us kind of how some of the key takeaways from kind of your lectures on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, I think um, so. I'll be giving a lecture, and it's not just me alone. This is actually a lecture that I do with two other people, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jeanette Pepper from SEO and then the dean of um, the uh, of UMSL, uh, Dr. Keisha Elder. Um, they uh, do a lot of DEI work and I'm on some committees with them. Um, and so we have a lot of discussions in large groups about uh, optometry and diversity within optometry. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, my phone is buzzing. Um, that's but, okay. Um, <laughs> that, that's the life we live in, right? I yes. can check my phone to yeah. make sure I have it on silent. Um, yeah, we're good. It's, yeah, I have it on, but it's buzzing. I hope it's not messing with your... No, no, yeah. I think it'll be fine. Okay. So, uh, so I have the opportunity to speak with a bunch of, you know, people that work in diversity within optometry and do uh, get a lot of perspectives on some of the things that I feel like optometry needs within the profession with regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so the lecture that I gave at Academy or with these other two optometrists, it, it really is a very foundational lecture as far as it gives just the fundamentals, um, some really simple definitions of just basic DEI terminology. What is equity, right? Um, what is privilege? Things like that. Um, and so I think that it's important to understand the basics mm -hmm. um, so that you know, approaching it is doesn't seem so scary. Um, and so that people can get comfortable with having those conversations. And so that's one of the major takeaways. Um, and it's about also not just talking about the obvious things of how we might be different, but it also um, 
looks at some of the things that you can't see um, that affect our perspectives, our ideas, how we feel about certain topics, how we feel about certain things, how open we are to other people. Um, and then also just commonalities like, you know, that we're all human beings. Most of us really want the same things, right? Um, the way I feel about my kids is the way that, you know, someone who doesn't look like me feels about their kids too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it brings some humanness to people um, and it lets us have a different perspective um, when it comes to interacting with each other. And I just think of um, when you when you mentioned that we all share so many commonalities, it reminds me of, uh, so when I was in school, uh, our school was very focused on diversity. And um, I remember our dean uh, at the time, Dr. Andrew Buzelli, he said that we all cry at the same things. We all laugh at the same things because he, he had experience, I believe, in the Air Force traveling mm -hmm. around the world. And he, he said that, yeah, no matter where you go, we're all the same beings. Right. And, and so I think that was a good kind of just moment. That was something that I carried forward. I'm like, that's true. Like, no matter who I work with and see throughout my life, they all are going to share those commonalities Absolutely. with myself. Absolutely. Um, in, in our, within our industry, because we can look at this whole diversity, and you put DEI is kind of the, your shorthand for it. Mm -hmm. We can look at it from within our own industry, and we can also look at it of how our profession approaches patients. Mm -hmm. uh, first, just like within our own industry, what are some of kind of the the challenges maybe our industry is facing that, that you would see? I think um, optometry is not unlike other medical professions in that uh, oftentimes people can have a real cookie cutter approach to the way that they see patients. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't allow your you to see your patient as a full human being, right? You may only see them as a set of eyes or that glaucoma patient or patient that's not compliant, right, right. in some way. Um, but when you take the time to really get to know your patients and understand what may be some of those barriers that may be keeping that patient from actually being compliant with the treatment plan that you have set forth for them, it gives you a different perspective and it brings I think some humanness to you as a doctor so I think practicing optometry like every other medical profession practicing medicine or something like that there's an art to it mm -hmm. you know um, and and some of that art is is being empathetic right and being human and I think there's a misconception that um, because you're a doctor that you are empathetic sensitive caring you should be right but not everybody is right um, and so um, I think that if most people took the time to really get to know their patients, mm -hmm. that cookie cutter approach would disappear. Um, and when you read studies that say, oh, you know, an African American patient is more likely to have glaucoma. Yeah, that might be true. They, but, um, and just because they're more likely to have glaucoma, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're more likely to go blind, but they are going blind at a higher rate than other people that have glaucoma, right? And why is that? Is it compliance? Is it that no one's actually told them how to use it? Right. I cannot tell you the number of patients that I see and I'm the first person to sit down and they've been diagnosed with glaucoma for years, yeah. but I may be the first person that sits down with them and actually explains to them what glaucoma is, how you go blind from glaucoma, why using your drops is actually important, mm -hmm. why you shouldn't be missing your drops and patients will tell me nobody's ever told me this nobody ever you know and and i think that's a travesty it is. um and i don't think i'm special i think i'm i take the time to make my patient feel special but i'm not special every optometrist could do the same mm -hmm. thing you know um and and that is is part of what DEI is, right? Giving every patient the opportunity to be heard, to feel like an individual, um, and to be treated with um, a very personal approach. And I think there's, that's just so beautifully said, the, there's so much I think that could, could go into that. The, the way I, th I think, kind of like you touched on, are the way we're kind of trained to mm -hmm. see disease mm -hmm. and treat we like we treat the disease, right? right? And uh, we do. I think it's very easy because we're pushed. We have to see so many patients. Yes. We have to see patients in five, ten minutes. You know, uh, like I have a family, a, f a friend who's a family doctor, and she's she she's not happy with her job because she is so pushed by insurance and just the way 
the way the economics of healthcare is. Mm-hmm. Like she doesn't have time mm-hmm. to focus and have conversations or get to know. She can't even answer all of their questions because mm-hmm. she has to get to the next patient. And so I, I can understand why, because I've been there. I yeah. think we all have at yeah. some point, especially maybe as a student. Because uh, you're just like, I, I've got... 300 tests I got to do and I've got this other doctor over me who you know mm-hmm. I'm gonna get a bad grade and I gotta right. go quick and uh, I'm trying to figure this out and I can't and I'm sitting there spinning refraction wheels forever mm-hmm. and they can't get it get them seeing 2020 and why is this uh, and so I think it, it, it makes sense why we miss it but I, I love that you bring up like empathy mm-hmm. and really getting to think of your patient as like your neighbor mm-hmm. as like a community member uh, rather than just a face right just a, a name or, or a, a potential capture rate you know that sort of thing yeah I, I will tell you um my my mom is a veteran okay and my mom you know has military injury my mom goes to the VA and gets mm-hmm. care for a military injury and uh and I worked in the VA for years at the same VA that my mom you know would go oh. and get care for a while and um I used to always ask her how were your visits like what did the doctor say like you know do they need me to come talk you know like mm-hmm. do you need what do you need um and she would always tell me oh i got good care and this was great and they did this and then sometimes she would say oh they didn't listen to me they didn't you know answer my questions i don't even know why i'm taking this pill you know whatever is the thing and um and so i always took the perspective with my patients that i want to do for my patients what i want someone to do for my mom Right. Um, And so that's kind of how I approach my patients even to this day. Right. You're somebody's mom or dad or cousin or uncle or the right brother. Um, And so I always take the approach like I want to make sure I do everything for you that I would do. I would hope someone would do for my mom, too. Mm -hmm. Um, And that can be a little time consuming. Right. Um, And but you do have to learn how to you learn how to be efficient and empathetic at the same time. (laughs) Right. But but I think when you come at it from the from the right place um, and genuine caring, I think patients can feel that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think so, too. And I think that that is a huge I think a, w- a wake-up call to a lot a lot of doctors, not just in optometry, mm-hmm. but everybody should should sp- spend a little bit more time of just even just using your patient's first name. Right. Yeah. That that I find grounds me with having a really almost this open conversation mm-hmm. uh, to show my patient, like, no, I, I want to know how you're doing, yeah. not just how well you're seeing or what glasses I can help you with or, or medications and things like that. Mm-hmm. I want to know, like, how's life? Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think even to just a step further, I think when we think about treating our patients, we also have to think about um, the students that matriculate into optometry school when it comes to, uh, like, diversity, uh, DEI things. Um, we, we, we need a diverse student pool. Mm-hmm. You know, we need students that reflect, reflect the patients that we see. I think um, representation is important. You know, um, I think that um, patients need to oftentimes feel some kinship, whatever that intersectionality is that they have with Mm -hmm. the doctor, there needs to be some kinship there so that they, you know, trust you. Um, And you need to be able to build rapport with the patients. You need to find some commonality with the patient. And sometimes that's just humanness, right? Um, But sometimes it could be cultural references. It could be, you know, ethnic background, things like that. Um, So I think for us to be able to serve a diverse patient population, we also need to have a diverse student pool. Yeah. Do you know um, with your own school what kind of the student diversity is like? I know with gender, that's the only one I remember when I was in school back in like uh, 2011 to 2015. I think we only had like six or seven guys in our class. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The guys are disappearing. I do. The, the, there has been a push, right, for more males to come back into optometry. Um, so I think we were trying to make it equal and then we got really skewed towards, right, females in optometry um but i mean uh i think at at my university there are a lot of ladies um uh but i would say maybe we're about a 60 40 Mm -hmm. as far as like you know female to male ratio um i think when we look at like ethnic background things like that um we have a pretty wide range of different types of students many many languages spoken amongst our students um that's fantastic yeah yeah um and even amongst the faculty i think we have a pretty diverse faculty um but i think obviously there's room for growth i mean i think there's populations 
that we don't have large numbers. We don't have large numbers of African American students. Mm-hmm. We don't have large numbers of Hispanic students, right? In in our specific college um we do have a fairly large like muslim population of students um arabic speaking students um uh many different like asian uh students um so in that sense i think we are doing a pretty good job there obviously are some groups that are pretty underrepresented we don't have um maybe one Native American student in our force. So, I mean, we have some populations that are pretty underrepresented. Right. Yeah. And, and think, we got to work on that. Yeah. And I think uh, definitely even in Minnesota where I practice, um, we have some Native American tribes and I just, you know, don't have much experience with that. But uh, I think that is one one group of people that I just don't have much contact and experience mm-hmm. with. And it makes me kind of sad that, like, this is a huge part of our, our country. Yeah. Uh, is their heritage and, and this this group of people. And I, it's just it's sad that I don't I don't have that much experience. And I certainly haven't had a, a, a I don't I don't know of any colleagues who uh, are, are Native American. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the numbers are pretty small <laughs> yeah. with an optometry when it comes to that, you know. Um, and so I think that's something that we have to work on. Yeah, for sure. With um, like what what do you think is a way that we as a profession can bring more diversity in, into both our student population into the future of our profession um, is there anything as well as that um, professionals seeing patients can do better to help help maybe I don't know better better the bond communication with their community I mean I think they're the diverse populations are recruiting students right into optometry schools um and that has to be an active thing i think um i think that uh, representation is key i think that students need to see people that look like them come from the same backgrounds as them mm-hmm. maybe have similar experiences as them right uh you know in the profession say oh yeah i could probably do that too right um but i think uh with regard to doctors and patient care i think um doctors need to mentor um you know young people i think I talk to, I talk to, when I see young people and I, and they're like in high school or whatever, and I say to them, oh, what do you want to, what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, what are you thinking? You know, cause I'm like always trying to, you know, really put shine on optometry, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, oh, and they, if they say, oh, I want to be, oh, did you ever think about optometry? Optometry could be a great field. Like, and they're, no, wow, I never, you know, something like that. Um, but I think mentorship, mentoring high school students, you know, even catching them at middle school level. I've tried to recruit my daughter. She's not having it, but I've tried to recruit her friends too. <laughs> So I'm like, yeah, think about being an eye doctor, you know. So um, but I think those kind of things are important. And when it comes to your patients, I think really getting to know what their challenges might be, how you can be a better provider to them specifically. Right. Like we know you're going to get your CE. You're going to learn the latest and greatest, like cutting edge thing. Right. You're going to bring that IPL to your practice. You're going to do all those things. (laughs) Right. But that may not be what that patient needs. So get to know exactly what they might need. I've had patients say to me, I I don't take my glaucoma medication because I can't afford to pay for it, you know? And I go, okay, well, let's see if we can get you some resources. Let's see if we can get you a list of places you can call that might help with your cost of your medication. You know, just taking just a little, because I think we're quick to say, oh, the patient doesn't do what I asked them. They're not compliant or, oh, they don't care. Well, I I don't think most people don't care about their health. I think most people do care about their health, right? Um, But you have to also sometimes help guide them in the right way, you know? Um, I'll tell you, and I'll make this brief. I... um, was at a community-based clinic on yesterday with students. Um, And it's a clinic that's run by the state of Illinois, uh, and it's uh, like a health department type uh, clinic, a community clinic. And we go there twice a week and see patients. The majority of the patients there are Spanish-speaking only patients, Um, many of them newly immigrated to this country. Um, And, you know, they have a large set of different types of needs, right, that need to be met. And sometimes it's kids and, you know, their parents and elderly people. It's just a wide range of ages, but most of them, the majority of them are Spanish-speaking only. And so yesterday I had this patient who, um, you know, was talking about, you know, how he couldn't see and he needed to be able to see because he needed to be able to work um, to provide for his family. And so I sent the student in just to ask some more questions. What kind of work does he do? What is he used to doing? Like all these kind of things. And so she came back out and, um, and she was almost in tears. And she said he was saying that, you know, he doesn't have food and he doesn't have shelter and they're sleeping in the car and, you know, all these things. And 
that breaks my heart, right? Um, uh, because his kids aren't any more special than my kids, right? You mm-hmm. know, and uh, and I would hate for it to have those kind of challenges, right? Um, and so I immediately got on the phone and you know was calling one of the coordinators there. Is there something we can do with helping this man, you know, find meals and you know shelter and stuff like that? And they came right over, and so we were able to usher him into another part of that system to get him some resources. But that just takes a little bit of time to ask some additional questions, right? right? Just to make sure that people are getting their needs met. And that all sparked from really just asking, "What are you using your eyes for? How are you using your eyes every day? What kind of work do you do?" So I know exactly. Do we need to give you a bifocal? Do you need some sort of safety glasses like what are the you know what i mean um and it doesn't take long you know but 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 he was um extremely grateful just that we took that time to ask a few questions and to actually get him on the road to getting some resources for himself and his family right. you probably helped him and his family a hundredfold just by asking those few questions right. and and spending that extra five minutes right. right and that was with maybe a potential language barrier absolutely yeah and he didn't speak any english yeah but you know but you know we're able to communicate and we're able to you know do that and and I, to me that like i said it's not i'm not special i just really do care about the patients and I really do care that they're getting what they need mm-hmm. the same way that I hope somebody cares about my family members, right? And I think yeah, like it really goes to the broader idea of what optometry as a healthcare profession right. is. It's not just, we're not just treating the eyes, right. we have to treat the whole patient. That's right. And yeah. we have to really understand what are they how are they using their eyes but then overall what's going on and absolutely if there's a major health issue at hand we have to um kind of be the point point person to say okay this is where we have to go to next this is the resources we can do to help you absolutely we are primary care providers mm-hmm. we are oftentimes frontline for many things right and so um and so i think we have to take that seriously yeah. Well, from here, uh, you shared so much great insights, and thank you for just kind of sharing your thoughts on this, and I'm sure we can go in a lot deeper, but um, from here, uh, one big question I love to ask a lot of my guests now is, if you were somehow elected like the Surgeon General <laughs> Uh, of optometry right you were elected like we want you to take charge and what would you work on what would what's something with the this the profession of optometry that if you had one wish you could change and make optometry better um i really believe that i think optometry is a great profession Mm -hmm. um i don't know that i want to do anything else really right um but i think optometry has an issue with promoting itself Mm -hmm. i feel like we don't do a very good job of promoting what we actually can do right and what we actually do for patients right being those primary care providers being those primary you know eye care providers um and so i think we got to do a better job of of promoting you know ourselves as a profession make ourselves more interesting you know to recruit more students who want to go into a lot of people they don't think about optometry they just don't um and so I think we got to do better. Right. So that would be my push. Like, okay, we got we to gotta promote ourselves better. We really have to show people what the full scope of optometry is. Right. Yeah. And just to go back to full circle, like when you first got glasses. Right. Right? Like what's the one simple way to instantly improve your life? <laughs> you know, the quality yep. of your life. Just snap your fingers. Oh, pair of glasses. Yes. So amazing. Yeah. Uh Thank you so much again for being a guest here on the podcast. Uh, I look forward to hopefully maybe having you on as a guest again in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So that was our conversation for today. Thank you for joining us. And if you are enjoying the podcast, please do yourself a favor by following us on your favorite streaming service or subscribing to the show over on YouTube. And if you're someone who is finding value in this content and equally gives a damn about the profession of optometry, then please do us a favor and leave us a review on whatever streaming service you normally listen with. This will really help us out and help out other professionals find this content. Otherwise, thank you for listening in, and I hope you have a fantastic day.